New Zealand is a veritable land of the lost. It is home to a bunch of wacky birds that look straight out of the last ice age. Mostly because they sort of are. But the way it is today is not the way it used to be. The place was arguably once the last domain of the dinosaurs. Until just a few centuries ago, all megafauna were avian dinosaurs. One of the largest birds of prey of all time, Host's eagle, was the apex predator and scavenger. And a menagerie of armless megabirds served as the predominant medium and large herbivores. They were the moa. The natural ecology of the island took a major beating in the last thousand years, but new research sheds light on the interconnections of the beautiful but now fractured ecosystem. Some species like the various moa might be gone, but traces of them can still be felt in the forests they once roamed. Fungi are just as much a part of any ecosystem as the more charismatic plants and animals. Several types of fungus endemic to New Zealand are notable for just how conspicuous they are. Very brightly colored, these truffle-like and mushroom-like fungi don't closely resemble any of their nearest relatives found on the mainland. Researchers Alexander Bost, Jamie Wood, Jerry Cooper, Nick Bolstridge, George Perry, and Jeanette Wilmshurst considered this and other observations about ancient ecosystems and found a surprising connection between the still-living fungus and one of the island's absent avians. They published their findings in the Royal Society Publishing Biology Letters Journal in January of 2025. Samples taken from petrified feces or coprolites and identification of fungal spores both within the coprolites and from still living kiwi fungi showed something sizable was consuming ectomycorrhizal or EMC fungi not long ago and in large quantities. EMC fungi are usually symbiotic to the forests they live in, helping promote the health of trees and the foraging animals that moderate plant growth. They also help to ward off blights increase circulation of water and nutrients, and endure climate cycles like droughts. In most environments, EMC fungi are consumed and spread by large mammals, which detect them by smell, resulting in fungi that are often quite visually inconspicuous. After consumption, the fungus munchers go about their business. However, the fungi have other plans. What goes down the chute must come out the other end. This helps EMC spores to spread in the same way certain fruit-eating herbivores spread the seeds of their favorite snacks. What's weird about this is that any mammals that can currently eat this fungus were not present in New Zealand until Polynesian and then later European colonizers brought them there. Prior to human arrival, it is thought New Zealand was near totally devoid of mammalian life outside of a few seal and bat species. Mammals did once exist on the landmass, evidenced only by a tricky little fossil from the St. Bathins site. But whatever type of mammal it was, it seems to have gone extinct millions of years before most recent megafaunal extinctions. Additionally, if this oddly hued EMC fungus evolved its bright colors to better appeal to browsers to pick it up and consume it so the fungi could spread its spores, then it wasn't trying to appeal to large herbivorous mammals like others around the world. Trying to use bright colors to attract mammalian browsers is not a good idea. Primates, like ourselves, are actually some of the very few mammals that can see the three primary colors. A vast majority of hoofed mammals, one of the major groups of megafaunal herbivores and fungivores for the last 60 million years, are almost all red-green colorblind. This is why an orange tiger can blend in with a green background when stalking deer. To a deer, the tiger and the foliage look like they're the same color. Birds, however, have superb color vision, able to see into the ultraviolet spectrum and detect even more colors than primates can. The author team accidentally figured out the identity of the pooper when they ran some extra tests on the droppings. They originally thought the extra hard turds belonged to the kakapo. DNA tests, carbon dating, and DNA amplification of the rock hard droppings which had been collected in the Hodges Creek Cave in Northwest Nelson and Takahe Valley in Fjordland found them to be one of the medium-sized moa. 
The big fluffy pooper turned out to be an upland moa, Megalatrix didinus. In almost any other context, this dinosaur would have been considered large for a bird, often having a mass of about 35 kilos or 80 pounds. That's about the size of an emu, which most people would consider a bird that is large and is in fact not small. However, the upland moa was actually on the smaller end of the spectrum when it came to the nine moa species roaming New Zealand up until just a few hundred years ago. It was larger than the minuscule record setters on the low end like the little bush moa, but utterly dwarfed by enormous avians like the North and South Island giant moa. Before human arrival, New Zealand was a venerable paradise for these birds, which had evolved so far away from their flying ancestors that they had completely lost their arms and tailbone. The only major threat were several species of giant raptors soaring the sky, but they never made enough of a dent to send the moa to extinction. Humans arrived and decimated the birds by a combination of habitat destruction, overhunting, and introduction of new pest species that raided upland moa nests, destroying the eggs for the next generation as their parents were also put under pressure by human hunting. It seems strange that so many large ground birds died off so quickly in just a few hundred years when humans arrived, especially given modern humans evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago in Africa, right alongside the ostrich that is still with us today. So obviously it's not just that large ground birds are especially vulnerable to extinction. One of the main differences was lifespan and life cycle. Ostriches can lay up to about a dozen eggs that can have shells up to 4 millimeters thick. These eggs usually hatch after about 40 days and the chicks become mature and fully sized within their first year. They usually start families of their own within two years. Moa reproduction rates did vary by species but even the larger species like the southern giant moa had eggs with shells sometimes only half as thick as an ostrich. And unlike their very distant cousins in Africa and Asia, moa grew up slowly and only had a few eggs at a time. Some species would take a decade to reach maturity and would only have one or two eggs at a time. The moa were not built for an environment with multiple land predators raiding their nests and depressing their adult population. Whereas ostriches, emu, and rhea had evolved with omnipresent terrestrial predators at all stages of their lives. This is one major reason why they were so vulnerable to extinction even from just mild pressure. It's not like the first Maori explorers to reach New Zealand hopped off the boats and started slaughtering every bird they could see. Even just casual hunting combined with rats raiding slow to replace nests would have caused a population crash within a few generations. The story of how the moa went extinct is a sad one, but the upland moa in particular can offer a lot of insight into how they lived. This species is very well represented with unfossilized remains, including mummified heads, skin, feet, and plenty of surviving eggshells now housed in museums across New Zealand. Traditionally, the upland moa were thought to predominantly dine on leaves and twigs, based on research on the use of the shearing beak for snipping off bits of food, combined with strong processing from the robust crop. Now, thanks to the research of the fungi author team, it seems that this bird wasn't as picky as once thought. The same beak and crop would work very well cropping off chunks of EMC fungi and readily digesting the stuff. This method, lacking the chewing seen in mammalian herbivores, would allow plenty of fungal spores and other material to survive digestion and come out the other end. In this way, the upland moa could very easily act as a mobile spore distributor after scarfing down a meal of the tasty and eye-catching fungus. Fungivores, or animals that mostly consume fungi, are common throughout the animal kingdom. However, most are very small because fungi are relatively small. Keeping a large body size on just fungi is difficult to do. In fact, I don't think there actually are any large animals that are exclusive fungi munchers, though there are many that incorporate the non-plant, non-animal into their diet. The extinction of nearly all megafaunal fungivorous herbivores in New Zealand has had a detrimental effect on the fungi that relied on them for distribution. There aren't any easy replacements either. Mammalian digestion can be quite different to that of birds, making large mammals a poor substitute for the moa to distribute EMC fungal spores to different areas of the forest. 
In this way, the moa helped to promote not just the fungal species, but also the trees and shrubs the fungi were symbiotically linked with. This means the important roles that native fungi played and currently play in the propagation and health of the beautiful New Zealand wilds is at risk. Additionally, the dynamic between these native fungi and the big birds was unique. Some have suggested importing ratite birds. Ostriches, emus, cassowaries, and rheas might be a suitable replacement for the extinct moa. However, without the uniquely evolved symbiotic relationships between bird and fungi and the quite different feeding behaviors between ratites and moa, this seems like a poorly thought out fool's errand. After all, multiple different species of moa once coexisted together across New Zealand, all with different feeding strategies and diets. So just airdropping in some big birds from elsewhere might not replicate even just one of those species. Just importing another large bird species like emus wouldn't solve the problem without careful research or application. The loss of the native megafaunal fungivorous herbivores means that any of the fungi or plants that relied on them are living on borrowed time. If these vulnerable fungi go extinct, so might the plants that rely on them. New Zealand still has plenty of fascinating endemic species, but that number continues to decrease. Insights like the Boast and Friends Fungal Symbiosis Study goes to show how complex the food webs of New Zealand's recent past really were. This goes to show how paleontology can help shed light on how ecosystems can be better understood both before and after a keystone species is removed. With more information like this, hopefully groups of organisms like the EMC fungi can be better protected from joining the MOA in extinction. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.